there's a question. There we go. All right. Can we have the first slide? I'm I'm sorry, my my I mouse decided not to work. Okay. Well, you know what? I have them in front of me, so I can kind of walk through it. Uh, you need to have a goal or an idea in mind before reaching out to who, who you might want to partner with. You want to make sure that you have an action plan that has been vetted by those on your committee. And then think about your community. Are there businesses, schools, churches, other organizations that benefit women and girls? Um, is it a national, a local, or an international organization? And then do they have existing projects that kind of mesh with Zonta's goals? There's a few out there, Girls on the Run, Publish, Polish Pebbles, I Am Beautiful, um, the Boys and Girls Clubs, and those are just a few. Next screen. So why should we work together? Let's uh, think about that. What you're looking for is an organization that you will complement. Part of the problem is deciding whether you wanna actually collaborate. It isn't easy. There will be many leaders and few workers. Egos may end up bruised, but Collaboration is often needed to achieve large and lofty goals and even really small ones. Um, so why do you wanna do it? You're given an, an opportunity to tap into endless pools of talent. So why not give it a try? It's an opportunity for growth and with the right goal, use of the correct techniques, expectation setting, anything is possible. You get the best from the best. Um, so, so my aim during this portion of the talk is to kind of complement or puncture um, some of the items on each screen, but it's really important that you consider selecting a spokesperson who has some kind of pre-existing relationship if possible and use them as part of your sales team. And then the most important piece will be to practice, practice and practice. Uh, you need to know your group's purpose, what your plan is, what the needs will be of the joint organization. And you also need to be able to inform the organization you're reaching out to, what's the benefit to them of partnering with your club? <clears throat> and then obviously, make your phone call, set your appointment, and be ready to visit. If you think there might be some benefit from a pre-call and, you know, sort of setting, um, expectations for, for what's to be discussed and make sure that the necessary pre-parties are there, then, then reach out before. Next. So let's talk about next moves. You've found a partner. Now you need to generate a cohesive plan and each partner must participate. Each of you on the team also needs to be a participant and be fully involved in the details, the deliberation and the deadlines. Otherwise failure becomes an option where it really should not exist. So first questions to be answered, agree on an event, set your goals and identify what your results will be. Once you've done that, then develop your timeline, uh, fill out your action plan, now working with both sides and figure out who's going to take responsibility for what 
It really is helpful if you have members from each of the partnering organizations on each segment of the development of your event. So the biggest issue will be that each of you understand that you're responsible for the success and failure of your event. Accountability absolutely has to be accepted by every member. You stand and fall as a group. So in terms of resources, that becomes very important and you need to have that discussion as part of your plan development. Uh, you need to know what those resources will be, who will contribute them, and how those resources will be marshaled. And the resources can come in the way of skills, time, volunteers, and, and money for that matter. So, Decide up front how the resources will be used, where they may even come from, and then um, how each of the partner members will make sure that they're not exhausted prematurely. Next screen. All right, success is possible when you have planned for most known and worst case scenarios. And, um, some of you have probably heard this from me. I'm, I'm a lawyer um, in my real life and um, I plan for redundancies whenever possible. So if there's a paper version, there's also an electronic version. And if there's an electronic version, then there's a thumb drive version because I have had those epic, epic fails and it's not comfortable. So. Um, it never hurts to have multiple copies in multiple ways. Um, make sure everybody shares in the decision making equally. It is crucial to a successful partnership that everyone is straightforward and honest, especially when problems come up. It's important that everyone accept their responsibilities and have realistic expectations. And it is also important that the members of the teams discuss in advance and then during the unwinding of the event, um, who has the right skills and strengths because you may need to reshuffle as you move forward because one person's plate may become more heavy than the another's. Um, so have that skill assessment done on a, on a rare, regular basis. Next. These are some other items that you want to consider when um, you're building and moving through that, that partnership. It is important that everyone accept the fact that deadlines mean something, that commitments and promises mean something, and that each person and each team will meet those timely. It's kind of like building a pyramid. Every step depends on the proper completion of the step before, otherwise you have a crumbling structure. And I know it may sound counterintuitive, but it is important to make decisions in the best interest of both of the organizations and the project, because uh, you, at the end of your collaboration, both organizations need to be comfortable with what happened and how they have come across, not only to their own membership, but to uh, the community at large, the public. And I cannot overemphasize the next point, and that is to document your work and to share with the entire team. Everyone needs to know what's going on, but not everyone needs to know the minutia of every moment of what's going on. It's just important to document what you did, who said what, why it was said, whether it was accepted or what, if it was rejected, why, 
because those will be points at some point you will be reviewing and analyzing to determine if perhaps that's something that needs to be tweaked. So document, appoint one, maybe two people, perhaps even a member from each organization to document what's happening in, in each phase and for each committee. Otherwise, you're not gonna have a full picture of, of what occurred and how that partnership melded together. Uh, another important point might be to create a team that's going to act as your tiebreaker um, and have that team, even or odd numbers, have a representative, a representative goodness from each organization uh, because there may be points that come up, they could be heated, that will require someone to make a decision. And then um, be, be, be ready to share credit for successes and move on. Um, next. So in summary, in terms of selecting a partner organization, complete a list of possible partners. What resources can they offer for the target? the target project, why might they agree to partner, be prepared to explain to them, have your selling points for why you're a good partner. Consider whether there's anyone in your club that has a pre-existing contact with the organization you're reaching out to. Decide who they are what they will say, get contact information, obviously set meetings and committees to develop action plans, document everything. And I didn't put this in, in my slide because it seems obvious, but I'm going to actually say it because it's truly important. And that is always say thank you after each call, after each meeting, each act, when the event is completed, thank everyone on the team, anyone who made it possible, and especially the attendees and the recipients of the project. They are all important to the success of your event. The key components are respect, communication, commitment, and performance. And then lastly, on this topic, um, think about conducting what um, some refer to as after action reviews. So you're, you're basically fly specking the whole thing. Do not be afraid and be brutally honest. How was it received? What went well? What did not go well and why? Who really shined and why? What needs to be tweaked? How can we learn from our mistakes? Believe in what you're doing. Lead so those following are at least as energized for change as you are and be authentic always. Any questions or more importantly, contributions, comments from the floor or from our virtual attendees? Please. Good morning, Isabella. It's Sally Bean from Zanta Club, E Club of USA 3. Good morning, Sally. Um, Isabel, could you give us the story of one of your successful partnerships? Just give us some, you know, the context around. So you've given us the how to, but can you tell us the story of one that, that you've completed? Sure, and that's actually in the next segment, but one of the ones that we're particularly proud of is um, we, we joined forces with the state attorney's office here in town to honor the victims of 
crimes, M more importantly, domestic and um, child abuse victims. And for that, um, we actually held meetings with the victim coordinator and with the state attorney's office. And then we had to seek uh, permission from the, the mayor and the city council to do what we were proposing. And what we proposed, and you'll see pictures in the next segment, um, it was an actual victim's pinwheel garden. And each of those pinwheels represented a victim in Logan County of some sort of abuse. And the hope and the prayer being that um, by having that visual realization of how many people actually were harmed, that the public who walked around and went to the shops and the restaurants in town square would realize that we don't live in a bubble, that what happens everywhere happens in Logan County, even though we might only have a, a tiny fraction of the population, the implication of abuse exists everywhere you are and you cannot escape it. And so it was our hope that by um, having this visual reminder that was beautiful on its face, but represented um, a, a concept that is horrific, that um, the public would understand and accept that um, they need to be ready to help and they need to figure out a way to, to provide some sort of assistance to, to these people in need. So that was one of them. Thank you. Any other comments? I have a question from the virtual. I'm going to rephrase this question, uh, Isabel. It's, yep. uh, they, they want to know if there were any situations where it, this kind of partnership did not work and what was learned from such an issue? So um, the partnerships have worked. There were a few instances where we needed to tweak our communications and um, to, to know deadlines um, probably sooner than later. And what I'm speaking of is that in one instance, we wanted to do something fairly on the fly and then ran up against, um, so I'm gonna say this nicely, um, government requirements and um, time constraints. And so it's important to, if at all possible, have everything planned in advance because it could be that everything is ready except for you don't have permission to do what you want to do. Um, we, we did a, um, a walk with the college and the universities here in town and it was um, a, a beautiful event um, because you had you had young children, you had uh, college students, you had the elderly, and obviously our club and other members of, of our community. And that paperwork, just to get permission to march from one of the universities to the downtown area, and then have um, a meeting of the mines um, in the downtown square, was something that required a good deal of, of red tape. And so again, an, a very effective event. It got our name out there. We were able to get our points across, but it took months of red tape planning and not so much our actual plan of action planning. Any other comments or questions? Yeah, I have one question. Linda Lakarian, 
Houston, District 10. Um, quick question, when you're selecting or looking at possible partners, do you have to take into consideration the Zonta uh, rules, if you would, regarding bipartisanship and relig religious affiliation, that type of thing? Would you be able to partner with, for instance, uh, a church uh, if, if your, actual, your goal is to bring awareness of uh, violence against women? So um, if you have any doubt, reach out to your area director and to your, your district um, board for ideas in that, that scenario. But I think what, you, what you're primarily focused on is the cause the action, how is it that um, your goal for the event, uh, how, how does that mesh with Zonta's overarching goals? And if, if they are consistent, then I, I don't know that there would be pushback with working with other partners. Um, a church has as many um, clerical points of contact as it does um, contacts with the general public. So I'm, uh, I'm not sure, I guess it would depend on um, if they were insisting on doing something that perhaps might be considered more political than um, open, then perhaps you might have to have those conversations with them. But the point of most of your partnerships will be to do some good and or get a point out to the public for their recognition and for their discussion oftentimes is, is what we're seeking. We're, you know, raising consciousness. So uh, again, I go back to your district governance and see if, if they have any concerns. And then of course, obviously, depending on, on what you're doing and where you're doing and how you're doing it, you may need to look at the insuring agreements and see if, if something might be needed there. Anything else? I may not have answered your question and I apologize. No other comments at this time, Isabel. Okay, well then why don't we move to the next section of the presentation. And that is um, talking about the types of organizations that you might end up working with or considering. So there might be service organizations, they may be governmental in nature, or it may be an organization that has the same action or issue that Zonta has as one of its goals and that your club is trying to sponsor. Next. So these are some examples of service organizations. You might want to partner with other Zonta clubs that would be uh, the easiest partnership in my opinion, as your goals should be virtually identical. And um, hopefully you would be able to, to work out your plans and have um, all of those points of contact work smoother. Uh, there's obviously other service organizations like the Kiwanas, the American Red Cross, um, would be a great partner. Women's clubs in your city or your county, uh, their nonprofit organizations, perhaps Habitat for Humanity. And what follows are some um, breakdowns. So let's go to the next screen. One of the things that, that we have done and others in, in our area is, um, to support the American Red Cross. And we do that by um, providing the bodies, not only for the blood drive itself, 
but to uh, setting up the blood drive. So we help to coordinate the event. We call prior donors. Uh, we provide personnel um, to move those donors through the, the blood process. And um, we also make snacks and, and make drinks available to the donors after they have um, sat through and then we keep statistics. Those statistics are provided to the American Red Cross and they greatly appreciate the help because um, there's a, a terrible need right now. And um, it's a very simple collaboration. It's very effective. You're in the public eye you might get some, some newsworthy reporting out of it, um, either through you know, your local sources or uh, perhaps the television outlets in town. So this is a simple partnership and it is very worthwhile. Next. So let's talk about some of the nonprofit examples. Obviously there are women's shelters food banks, soup kitchens, homeless projects. And the next page. Uh, as part of um, my work, we also have a segment where we contribute to the public good. And what we did was to set up we supported the build of, of an entire house and um, can supplement that with your, your Zonta teams. They have all female teams and they have contractors that are in charge of each project. And they will actually teach you the skills you need to know to build the house. And it's great when you have the ability to be part of an all female team because not a lot of folks um, see females building homes very often. And it's a great way to, to be out in the public and, and show that women are capable of anything they put their mind to. Um, there are jobs for everyone. Um, you can provide meals or snacks or drinks for the people who are doing the building. You can be bar part of a build team for the exterior. You can be part of the build team for the interior of the home. You can be part of the cleanup team. There are jobs for every walk and every skill level. I learned to put up walls, exterior walls. I never in a hundred years thought I'd, I'd be able to it and the house is still standing. So um, I, I really urge you to consider it. It's so much fun um, and, and you'll really enjoy meeting new people and, and it, it works really well. They do most of the heavy lifting in terms of um, the scheduling. They use these tools online so that your team can sign up. Um, you can build teams and the teams will get um, filled in throughout the work build schedule. So you won't be building every day. You won't even be building every week. You may be building a Saturday and a Sunday every other week or every third week, um, wherever they need you. It all depends on, on the the feedback from the public and how many teams they can get together. Again, um, fascinating, excellent work. And I, I can't tell you how much fun it was. Next. All right, so let's talk about some, um, what I loosely am calling a government related opportunity. Um, there are so many. One of them is CASA. Um, it's an, an amazing opportunity to be given to be a child advocate to a court. 
there are victims advocate offices and some of the state attorneys or some of the um, nonprofit um, legal teams have immigration projects where you can work with immigrants and help them to put together their paperwork for um, advanced screening and then for their hearings and there are so many different levels where where you could be helpful even if you are not an attorney uh, there are places for just the general public to participate in that process what about crisis centers um, have you ever trained or worked hotlines? I did that um, when I was in college. And then again, when I was a member of the state attorney's office, um, it's, it's a very frustrating, but very rewarding job to know that you can be there for someone in their extreme time of need. They provide you the resources you need. They provide you the resources to offer the victims and they provide you the word tracks. If it gets to be um, too complicated, then there are uh, pivot points that they also provide you. Um, very helpful, very crucial work. You might be able to help out in a group home or fundraising for a special community project. Um, a program that's very dear to me because I was a prosecutor and my job was to prosecute the defendants who committed sexual assault on um, adults and the elderly. And um, so that sexual assault nurse examiner is very crucial to the collection of uh, the criminal evidence. But at the end of that process, your victims don't have anything to wear. So contact your, your local hospital, see if they have a SANE program, see if they're willing to let you collect and donate clothing or put together um, a kit for the victims. It may just be underwear, um, a pad, perhaps a bra. Um, just have those conversations with your local hospital. And there, there may be something um, that, that you and your club can do. Next. I have a question from the oh. witch. Yes. So um, Pat from USF3 says, my concern is that on the ground, volunteers might be light. I don't really understand the question though. Um, well, I guess there's two ways of interpreting that. One would be that there may not be much involvement from the club or that the volunteers might not be um, adequately prepared for what they might encounter. Um, the last point is easy because Part of vetting and getting people involved is giving them the tools they need to be effective advocates for children, for victims, for group homes. So don't be concerned about that. And if the, the concern is the prior that you may not have enough volunteers, it really doesn't matter. Each and every one of these opportunities represents a, a point of growth for you as an individual, for your club, and gosh, I, I can't even begin to tell you how much um, the recipients of that help are grateful for the time and the interest that you offer. Isabel, there's some clarity on this question. Okay. It's, it's regarding put, uh, potential partners when members are from e-clubs, you know, with, that belongs to multiple states and locations. So um, there actually is the possibility for crisis centers, for um, immigration projects, for uh, CASA advocates, 
um, to be a participant in electronic aspects of it. Uh, again, all you have to do is pick up the phone and ask the questions. Is there a program nearby? Is there um, something that I can do to help? All you have to do is offer your services and I guarantee you, they will come back to you ready to hug you because they, the need is so great. The fact that someone is willing to help will 99% of the time be accepted. And the need exists across the nation. Isabel, we have a uh, comment or question from the ballroom. Yes, Hi, Isabel. This is Tammy Hagen from Madison Club. Hi, Tammy. Hi. Um, and I, I'm glad you sort of mentioned Immigration Project. Um, our club has been having a bit of a debate uh, you mentioned a project through the state attorney's office, which would obviously be something that would be on the safe side to do. And, and the way I say safe is uh, some members of our club are interested in doing some immigration projects for undocumented immigrants. And part of the club then is hesitant to want to support that because of the legal ramifications of dealing with somebody who's in the country as an undocumented immigrant. And whether that would potentially open Zanta and the Zanta Club of Madison and Zanta International to some sort of risk um, to our good name. If there was, you know, if we sign up to work with a community organization that was helping these individuals and in ICE would come along and raid the association, raid the people who were coming to the association. And that's what these people worry about is that they show up, that they might be captured in a net that ICE seems to like to do um, unexpectedly. So I was wondering your opinion about what you think about that as a possible problem for a club being involved in the, threatening the name of Zanta if that action occurred? So what we did in our club, Tammy, is um, because of, of who I am and, and the context that I have, and because of my law department's involvement, um, I was able to bring representatives from the, the local immigration project to our club to talk about how our members might be able to help. Filling out paperwork, doing initial interviews, um, if you happen to be Spanish speaking, French speaking, um, <clears throat> just doing something that simple. And you're doing it under the arc of a licensed organization like um, a pro bono organization whose job is solely to help these unfortunate victims through the immigration process. Um, so I think, um, and if your club is interested, um, I can reach out to my local contacts and um, have them re reach out to you all and maybe tell you a similar group. Um, and, and the reason I'm saying this is um, if my law department is willing to support it and for us to do our pro bono work through them, then it's probably relatively safe because they're not going to risk the, um, well, I would not think that they would risk the enterprise name by having that collaboration. So I'd be, I'd be happy to help. Um, I, I, like I've said before, each and every one of these projects is uh, very worthwhile. And there are every little piece and every little bit of assistance that can be offered will be met with monumental praise and approval. 
Um, and so if your club is looking for that good heart feeling, um, th this is a way you can do that and, and make a huge, huge difference and impact. Thank you, Isabel. Okay. So let's move on to the next screen. So this is what I had talked about earlier, I think in response to uh, Sally's comment. Um, so this is our pinwheel garden. And um, we were able to work with the, the victim's coordinator. Um, she got us the statistics. We bought the items. We assembled the pinwheels. Yes, they come unassembled and they require a bit of knack, but you can see it's very impactful. And um, in terms of the lighting, that was just uh, amazing. But this is natural. This is not altered. It's just the way the photograph came out. And it was cold and there was uh, an unexpected breeze. And we actually did an on the fly interview on the courthouse grounds. And um, it's part of our Arzonta website and you can hear it, but you can also hear all the delivery trucks because it was, I don't know, maybe 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning. And um, people from the restaurants were coming out and asking what was going on, what was it all about? And it was really wonderful. It was a great opportunity for the club to talk to the public and to make an impactful visual statement. So that's um, that. And if we can go to the next screen, um, these are some other um, actions. So that take back the night, that's what I was talking about, joining with the local colleges and the community and some of the other service clubs in town. And um, that was, again, visually impactful and easy to do and wow. How often do you also get the opportunity for physical activity while doing some sort of a service project? Um, Walk a mile in her shoes is an amazing project. Um, in, in my area, my, my Springfield club, its members, they participate in Walk a Mile in Her Shoes. Um, annually and this past year they actually did it virtually and there are opportunities to do some of these things virtually as well if you cannot do them one-on-one uh, -on -one in person so let's move to the next um, slide poise for success is something that the zonta club of oak brook did um, they served at the poise for success fundraiser I've, they also support the organization. And um, there are different ways that you can help in these organizations. Maybe it's their fundraiser. Maybe it's shops that they have in town. Maybe it's mentoring some of their clients. Um, it, it all depends on what your time and your interests are. Like I said, there are so many opportunities and so many amazing recipients out there that could use mentoring from um, a really good hearted female. Um, let's go to the next screen. So this is, um, again, this is something my club did. Um, we, actually partnered with the Pregnancy Resource Center and amazingly enough with Walmart. We got permission from them to uh, hold a baby shower and we had um, their shopping carts outside. We had wish lists that we could offer the patrons of Walmart as they entered that contained items that the center needed for its clients, um, the mothers and their small children, um, they service children up to age five and mothers who are um, giving birth. 
and uh, through that fundraiser, we were able, and remember, we're in a very small community and we were just amazed at how much giving came from this opportunity. And we've done it three years in a row. Um, we literally filled two trucks and I don't know if anybody knows what a Ford Flex is, but it's like this huge uh, wagon. And um, we were able to present all of this to the Pregnancy Resource Center along with money and gift cards, which um, really warmed our hearts that, and it, was particularly moving because the people, some of the people who gave actually had benefited from, from the center itself. So um, again, there's probably numerous other outreach organizations in your areas for which you could do the same. And it, so it never hurts to ask an organization and a business like Walmart to see if they will let you partner with them through this process. You, you fill out their paperwork, you provide the documentation, and uh, most often they will allow it to go forward. But it needs to be for a proven organization. And um, obviously the folks at the Walmart in Lincoln knew about the resource center in town. Next. All right. So I'd love to hear from those of you in the audience, um, the live attendees, the virtual attendees. The purpose of, of this part is for us to share, to talk about um, what has worked, what kind of service projects you have done. Um, why do you think people attend them? What can you do to draw more attendance? How can you make it fun? Um, so I'd, I'd love to hear from a few and um, I would love it if you would submit your notes um, at the table and in the chat so that maybe we can put together a list of ideas so that every club benefits from today. Anyone? Anyone want to share? Who wants to be first? There should be a, a line around the building of people who want to share their service projects. All right, here we go. I'm Mary Reed from the Zonta Club of <clears throat> Jamestown, North Dakota in District 7. And we are a small town as well, and we have a pretty good partnership with our safe shelter. And one of our most fun ones we had was, um, there was a large gift and we donated as well to build an actual shelter because they didn't have a permanent building. And one day they got a note that our state Senator was going to come and tour the facility the next day because it was supposed to be opening. They weren't quite ready. And so they put out a call and as many of us members as could possibly do came in and we unpacked bedding we put things in cupboards, we scrubbed things down, we put up shower curtains. I don't know how many runs I made to Walmart because this didn't fit or that didn't fit or whatever. And they had a professional photographer there. And so anyway, we worked into the evening, uh, Zonchins, and the state senator came the next day, toured it, oohed and odd over it and everything, but the photographer put together a big collage of all these Zonchins working on stuff which is front and center in their building as you go in. So, so it was kind of cool. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and that's the kind of free publicity for lack of a better description that comes from acts of good. Hi, my name is Charlene Thomas and I'm from the Zonta Club of Montgomery. Uh, my club has traditionally worked with a group called Aid to Inmate Mothers. And 
what we do in helping with that group, we have to go through training and screening to be able to go into the prisons to help with their reading program. And over the years, we've gone from uh, cassette tapes, we I think we're up to jump drives now, where we provide a lot of the books for if the mother had, if the inmate mother is on good behavior, she gets to come in and pick up a book and we allow her to read a couple of pages, videotape her so she, so this can then be sent to their child. And it is something we've been doing for years and it can be quite a tearful event. And a lot of times we come away saying, they're constantly saying how much we've helped them, but they don't realize how much, I'm getting tearful, they help us. So this is, uh, like I said, something, this group we've been working with, unfortunately, we were not able to go into the prison during this biennium because of what's been happening. But one funny part, years ago, while we were there in the prison, a storm came, so they wouldn't let us out. <laughs> <laughs> and to ensure that they know us from the prisoners, no white, not even beige, do you wear inside. <laughs> But it's been a collaboration we've been doing for years and we thoroughly enjoy it. It's great. And there are so many different reading opportunities that exist. Um, reach out to your library. You can read to children. You can read to prisoners. You can read um, to the elderly. And you can actually participate in programs where you're reading to teach people to read. Uh, those exist. Uh, we actually invited um, one of the reading organizations to come in and have a talk at our club. So um, that's amazing, Charlene, and um, kudos to you and your club. Thank you. We'd like to hear, there is a chat. We'd like yeah, to hear there's from our two virtual. comments from the virtual crowd here. So Marjorie from ZD2 says their clubs partner with Mooncatchers, a non-for-profit that makes and distributes reusable menstrual kits and menstrual education in developing countries. Moonbeams are very involving. Efforts include collecting menstrual supplies for women in the US as well. And then Tanya from the Zonda Club of Guelph, if I pronounce that correctly, Take Back the Night partner with CFUW and Women in Crisis, International Women's Day panel discussions and meet on the bridge event, CFUW and Women in Crisis, Mocassins making, bringing them home, partner with local museums, bring them home and local indigenous women's group. I just read the whole thing they're doing, but I'm sure it's much busier, busier and takes longer than it takes to read this. Um, and then we have Pat from US3, which says, when a program is chosen that might work such as femme hygiene and diaper donations, how do you account for service hours for virtual clubs? Hmm. So I, can we reach out to someone in Cincinnati, um, Sally? How about you? Do you have an answer for that? Sally oh. Bean? So this is Catherine Cleland Zonta Club of Everett. Oh. And that was also my question is, does anyone have examples of virtual club service projects that have been successful? Our club did a hygiene drive. So everyone individually collected hygiene products and took it to their local domestic violence shelter but it didn't have the same feel. And so I'm looking for any insights or successes that virtual clubs have done. This is Sally. No, I'm here for my club because we're new and we are looking for this answer. So do you have an idea on how you might document your service hours? Um, can you just laud yourself for lack of a better description and on, on your website, on your Facebook page, with that, so I'm gonna call it acts of good. It can be 
just um, detailing. We're a five member club and we were able to donate 50 packs of uh, sanitary napkins and 20 boxes of um, tampons and 30 individual reusable menstrual caps um, because you're, you're still being impactful. And I can tell you that a photograph of that grouping of items is very impactful. Um, I actually had a photo that I that I could have made part of the the presentation, but you know you you got to pick and choose. But um, when you put everything together, and I'm I'm sure if you go and look in the back of your room where you are right now, where I believe they're collecting all of the donations for Tidal Babe and Sweet Cheeks, just the sheer numerosity is overwhelming and it may be that's what you do but more importantly why can't you do like the real clubs have available to them talk to local broadcasters do feel good stories with your online newspapers or your online news outlets they're all looking for bright moments right now 2020 and 2021 um the news feeds are looking for good things. And this is your opportunity to provide them with that. So um, use those untapped outlets. Those, those are just some of my ideas. Thank you. We have additional contributions or questions. Sure. Um, this is Tamara Hagen from Madison again, Isabel. So. I have an example of how our club worked a service project virtually. We didn't intend to, <laughs> but we had to pivot to that, which is one thing is you have to be very flexible when you're working with other partners and things come up. So we had a, a partner um, who we had interactions with in the past. So we were able to reach out with, to them. And initially we wanted to help them by funding and providing resources to run one of their what was called the accelerated policy institute and what they did is they um, took young women and trained them in advocacy and it was a whole weekend event and we had of course planned it in person uh, our club's responsibility was uh, we were given a certain number of scholarships to award to women in our community because we were providing funding to run the day. So our part of the process was to help organize the event and find and recruit these young women to get free advocacy training. Well, again, everything hit the fan and we had to pivot to a virtual event, which meant sitting down and figuring out how to do that with our partner. And it actually was very successful and we had great feedback so I think one of the things that pandemic is going to teach us is we're going to use more of these virtual events, even if it becomes open. And the beauty of it is we were able to pull women in from all over South Wisconsin instead of them having to travel to the event. We got more participation because they were actually able to zoom into the event. And I think they really appreciated it. We had members attend also and came back with glowing report of what they learned. So think about educational events or advocacy events that you can do it virtually. And, and Tammy, do you think that, that you could possibly take that event and organize it in the future to be- um, A hybrid event? Oh, exactly. Yes. I Long think all of us are learning how to do that more <laughs> successfully. So yes, I think it could be a hybrid event. Well, it sounds like it was fascinating and I would have loved to have been part of it, but um, obviously I'm not a member of the Madison Club, but I do have a candidate for you who's in the college. So I'll, I'll be sure to talk to you later. We have additional input. Thank you, please. Thank you. 
Sharon Hebert, Zana Club, or Zana E Club, USA 2, our club, we've done lots of, we're an E Club, we've done lots of virtual fundraising and service projects, advocacy also. One I'd like to highlight is it's called Free the Girls, and it's an organization that helps survivors of human trafficking. And what we do is we collect bras. We're in 10 states, states, and we have two members that are in the country of Mexico. So we collect these bras and we ship them off. And a, um, one woman can, in the, the countries they're in, they're currently in three countries and there's a pilot program in another, a fourth country now. And a woman can sell six to eight of these bras and sustain their family for one month in the, the various countries that they're in. And working with this organization, I got, I reached out and I had the executive director um, come to one of our meetings and give a program and, and talk to us more so we could understand more about what we were doing. Well, with this collaboration, they asked for our help because they were wanting to expand into a fourth country, which happened to be Mexico. We have two members there. And so we together worked with them and they're now, it's still a pilot program, but they're now working in Mexico to help survivors of human trafficking. And so anyway, we, we have lots of, oh, you have that one, yeah. Yeah, you can do that traditional or e-club. So anyway, we have lots of different ways that, that we raise our money. Okay, no. <laughs> That's amazing, Sharon, because there is um, a similar program uh, free the girls and, and the collection is for undergarments and they're for homeless women who um, find themselves on the street and um, both projects are just absolutely amazing. Yes, yes they are but yeah we're um, anybody has any questions or whatever just ask me free okay. the girls and I think it's free the girls org is you know mm -hmm. real simple. But yeah, Sharon Hebert, if anybody wants any or has any questions or I wants ideas and vice versa, let us know too. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Good morning. Hi, Isabel. This is Anna Westlack. I am the District 6 governor and uh, happened to be in that Oak Brook Club that was up there. So thanks for including the slide. Uh, but I wanted to share with you when we were deciding what to do with our fall conference, um, we have our service chair who is here with us. Um, and I has a small committee and I, she and I were chatting and said, what can we do if we can't have a fall conference, but we still want to do a service project as a district. So what we did was a blanket drive and every club was asked to collect blankets make blankets, buy blankets, whatever they wish to do, and then have a point person in their club who would collect them and then take them to a local social service organization that would be happy to accept those. So we were able to spread blankets throughout our three state um, district of um, Illinois, Indiana, and Wisconsin. And yet it was a project that all of our clubs did. So that was how we overcame not being able to be together. That's amazing. And um, thank you. I, I want to interject as a member of District 6. I um, want to interject for the virtual crowd that is uh, lighting up the chat here. Sorry, guys. Uh, so Gloria from uh, Bur uh, the Santa Club of Burbank D9 wants to comment. She says, during COVID, our local YWCA experienced a huge surge in domestic violence. Victims and the wise uh, toiletry supplies were very low. We put out a flyer on our social media, con contacted several organizations and faith communities and used the church parking lot for people to drive up, pop their trunk, and we collected the items with no contact. The response from the community was overwhelming, and we had random people who actually stopped and parked their cars to help us pack the toiletry bags. I'm not done. <laughs> Uh, Marjorie from Zonda Club of Albany also contributes, uh, says that their club also contributes to, the, to free the girls. We have partnered with local businesses, especially those 
selling products and services for women, and they allow us to set up collection bins in their stores. Tanya from Guelph again. We collected for uh, we collected for free the girls in Canada, but issues getting they had issues getting the bras across the border without paying duty charges since the bras were being resold. Since you were working closely with Free the Girls, is there anything we can do to help from Canada? So here's a nice opportunity for some collaboration as Isabel was talking. And uh, I just have one more question. There's a lot of communication here about um, service um, hours or uh, documenting service for e-clubs, which I think ultimately is a big question. And um, let me see. So first of all, some clarity. Does Zonta expect clubs to be recording service hours? I thought no, okay. So in, in our club, um, there are recommendations for um, service hours. There's a part of our uh, yearbook that um, has an area where you can document what you did. But I, th I think just like where I work, um, it's, it's the fact that you're doing and then making a note of having done that's important. And I, I don't know if for the, the virtual clubs or the e-clubs, um, there is a, a documentation requirement or not, but um, I guess that's the way I perceive it as um, not a requirement, but a way to help you to fulfill that obligation. It looks like Joan from D4 agrees with you and she says, that it's more important that the number of hours, um, let me read this correct. What is more important than the number of hours is what you achieved and labeling it as a Zonta activity publicly. But I believe this is a great discussion for e-clubs and I'll, I'll give the mic to the floor. Uh, Linda Lacarian, Houston Club, uh, District 10. Um, for a number of years, we've actually partnered with the Women's Home, which is for women in crisis. It's a residential program, and we teach vocational classes. With COVID, we had to go virtual. So for clubs looking for virtual type opportunities, but um, vocational programs are things that we all know. Uh, over the years, our, we now, our program now consists of 13 segments. It's spread over th nine weeks. We teach them on Friday afternoons. And in order to go virtual, though, we had to provide the women's home, the clients, with a laptop and a hotspot. And obviously, the classes then were taught via Zoom. Um, as of two weeks ago, we're back now in person. Yay, it's so much so much better to be in person, but uh, the opportunity for other clubs to do something similar virtually is great. Um, when we went to COVID though, we had the opportunity to add additional uh, programs. Uh, career, well, we've had career exploration, time management, team building, dress for work, interview techniques, resume writing, LinkedIn, all of those things that so many of your members know, already know how to do. And if anybody's interested, let us know, we'll be glad to provide you with our PowerPoints, no editorial pride. You can change them as you like. So anyway, so that's one of our big um, programs. It's Friday afternoon. So unless someone working is off on Friday afternoons, they're not able to participate. The Women's Home also then has two uh, apartment, co large apartment complexes in the city uh, for uh, either funded by the Coalition for the Homeless or very low income. So on Saturdays, pre-COVID, and we'll be starting to back up again in August, we would do then each month an event on Saturday at each either the what we call the garden place for the adults or the family place for the families. And they would be fun things. They would be, but we would tie something educational in with it. So it'd be recreational and um, uh, educational. Thank you. So that then helped our... Uh, a lot of our members who work are those that didn't weren't comfortable teaching vocational come out and then really participate with hands on. So look at those types. And for us in Houston, such a large area, we just wish we had more members so that we could take definitely our vocational program to some of the other women's shelters in the city. 
That's amazing, Linda. And um, I, I personally will be reaching out. Hopefully I wrote your name down correctly, but um, because those are, are great ideas. And um, it's also something that, that can appeal across the board to um, every age factor in your club from your younger members who might have family commitments because you know, these are opportunities for them to actually bring their family to an event. Um, they want to be part of our clubs. They want to be part of our service. They want to learn, they want to be trained. And if they can involve their children in that activity as well, then that is just an added benefit. So the fact that you're doing something that will appeal to a wide spectrum of club membership is fabulous. And is it Linda, L-E-C-L-A-R-Y? L-I-C-A-R-I-O-N-E. L-I-C-A-R-I-O-N-E. I-O-N-E. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. And actually, uh, thank you for commenting on that because when um, our uh, family place events that we would have on Saturday, members then could bring their children. And it mm -hmm. then gave them an opportunity for their children to meet children that have less and, and, but then again, they all still play together and, and really enjoy whatever the craft or activity is. And that's, that's the part where you're reaching out to the, your millennials and your Gen Xers because they want to be part of a community action, but um, oftentimes they also want their family to participate as well. We have additional examples coming. Thank you. And I'm Gail Zalewski from Zonta Club of Madison. And the Zonta Club of Madison has a working relationship with End Abuse Wisconsin. And End Abuse Wisconsin puts out a list of all of the victims who perished from domestic violence just before the start of Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So Zonta Club of Madison ha has a walk around the Capitol where they carry the flags with the names of the victims. And then after the walk, the names of each victim is read aloud. And I actually live 90 miles north of Madison in Stevens Point. So rather than going down to Madison to take part in their walk, I actually started a walk in Stevens Point. And now we walk in Stevens Point and carry flags with the names of victims. And we then read the names aloud of the victims. So we have a parallel walk in Stevens Point while the walk is going on in Madison. So rather than create a virtual event to go along with the Madison event, we created a parallel event to go along with the Madison event that goes on at the same time. And so those two events are getting publicity because we've got events going on throughout the state that end abuse Wisconsin, three events, because Milwaukee, um, has an event now as well. So we have the three events going on in Wisconsin that get um, publicity at the same time by End Abuse Wisconsin for us, for the Zonta Clubs of Madison. So it's really turned into a great thing for us. Fabulous opportunity, Gail. And you're getting the word out. We have other comments, please. Uh, this is Sarojini Rao, and I am the, uh, me a member of the Zonta Club of Cleveland and also the District 5 governor. Uh, I want to mention that for many years now, we are partnering with an organization called Days for Girls. And that this is an organization that provides sustainable hygiene um, kits to young women and girls in developing countries. And we, uh, our club, we put together, uh, we sew, we cut, and those who can sew on the machine, we sew uh, kits and uh, put them together. Um, but what I want to say is that we introduced this to, I have uh, my niece here, 
whose daughter goes to a school and she used that as her uh, um, uh, senior project. And the young ladies, uh, four, how many, four or five girls? Two girls, they put together eight, eight kits. And so somewhere in this developing country, there are eight women and or girls who are now able to go to school, go to work because of these sustainable kits that we are providing them. And we have been doing this for about four to five years now. And that is one of our projects. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Governor. And um, the other clubs can reach out to your club if they want details on how they might be able to do these kits as well. Certainly. Excellent. We have time for one more. Hi, Teresa from the Roscommon County Club in Michigan. Um, two quick things. We did a service project where our members sewed um, toiletry bags and then collected donations and gave them to the local foster closet for the teenage girls so they would have something to take with them. Um, but I'd like to reiterate also, I work for a small newspaper and they are looking for good news. So especially your e-clubs, collect pictures of all of your club members or, or a group of club members from, I mean, send more than one photo if you want, um, send it to their local papers, um, would just include their names and their locations of where they're from and that they're a, a local e-club for Zanta, even if it's over the state, you can still send pictures from other states to just make sure there's one local person in there. And I've got one suggestion from the virtual, actually from Marjorie of Zanta Club of Albany, D2. And she suggests moon catchers might be an option for e-clubs. And to contact them, it's www.mooncatchers.org. She suggests calling Eli Van Welsheim or another member of the board if you need to set this up. And while on-site moonbeams, moon bees, I believe these are the, this is the group that makes the kits, are mostly in New York. They also accept donations and provide instructions on how to set up moon bees. Thank you. That's Isabel, it. we have five minutes remaining. Do you have closing comments or inspiration for us? Um, so um, I do have a, a few closing comments. Um, so I, I really want to thank everyone for, for sharing because part of the, my reason behind this was we all do so much for so many and maybe we don't have to recreate the world each and every time if we can benefit from each other's experiences. And we're sisters after all, so why not share? Um, but there's an entire segment of my presentation that we didn't get to, and that's okay, um, where I give you a little bit of, of, of information about uh, generations, um, who your target audience might be. Take a look at it if you want. Uh, call me if you have questions um, because we want to do something that um, can be very targeted or we might want to do something that appeals across all segments of society. And depending on who you're looking at and who you're trying to benefit, um, there are different aspects that you may want to consider. So like I mentioned um, when uh, Linda was talking that um, if you're a millennial or a Gen X or, or a Gen Z, um, you want to participate, you want to have training, you want opportunities to involve your family. And so all of that is important. I also have, have given you the benefit of, gosh, uh, 22 years of experience in holding um, live and silent auctions for schools, for churches, for organizations. 
And um, at least with one entity, we went from raising approximately $7,500 in one year to 45,000 the next year by just tweaking things. So it's possible. It's all in how you do it and how you focus your efforts. And most importantly, take every opportunity that you have to help someone, but make it fun. If you make it fun, people will come. And more importantly, people will stay with you and participate in the future. And I thank each and every one of you for your time, for your attention, and most of all, for your participation. And each and every one of you travel safely if you're in Cincinnati and for those who are attending virtually, travel safely as well. Thank you so much.